for coming today. I, I don't mind small groups. I hope you don't feel awkward being here. <laughs> um, let me tell you a little bit about myself and um, what we're going to be talking about today. My name is Dr. Rochelle Hookstra Anderson. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist and life enrichment coach with Crossroads Renewal Coaching and Counseling. And um, my background is I worked as a clinical psychologist. Um, I've been a college instructor and a college counselor most recently until I um, developed my own business, which is what I'm doing now. Um, it's coaching people, which I love to help people get to their, their dreams and their goals in life. And sometimes you need someone to help you get there. We can all set really good goals, but like New Year's resolutions, they tend to kind of fall flat after a few weeks. So my goal is to help people to take steps toward where they would love their lives to be. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, so today I was asked to come and speak about gratitude and it seemed like it was really appropriate because this is the month of Thanksgiving. So um, are you, would you consider yourselves grateful people? Are you grateful to be here today? Sort of. <laughs> Not a resounding yes, but I got a nod. That's good. Okay. Well, let me tell you a little bit about what gratitude is and why it's, it, it even matters. Um, from a psychological standpoint, it is absolutely essential to our well-being, and I'm going to show that today in our presentation. So if you grew up in a home like I did, you were taught the importance of good manners. Uh, from as young as I can remember, my parents instilled in me the virtue of saying please and thank you. And of course, then it was reinforced through my faith upbringing, which further taught me the importance of giving thanks and appreciating every good thing in life, even tough things, which helped me develop a greater appreciation for things I may have taken for granted previously. And then when I became a parent, I continued the practice of instilling the value of gratitude in my children. And I wonder how many times my daughters heard me say, what do you say, um, right after I served them something or they received a gift. And unfortunately, I believe we live in a culture that is increasingly focused not on thanksgiving, but criticism giving, or complaint giving, or just plain indifference. I hate to say it, but one of my greatest pet peeves is when I'm checking out at a store or a restaurant and not ever hearing the word thank you. Thank you has been replaced with, there you go, or no acknowledgement at all of your loyalty as a customer. If a lack of gratitude in a store can lead me to feel diminished, unvalued, unappreciated, or even worse, invisible, what does an expression of thanks do for me? I know that when I hear thank you, it lifts my mood. It makes me feel better. It makes me feel better about even having patronized the business where I um, chose to spend my money. But why is saying thank you or expressing gratitude or even just being genuinely thankful for the little things in life so instrumental to a life of joy, peace, and contentment? Well, you're going to find out in my presentation that it serves as an opportunity to, that this is going to serve as an opportunity to check in with yourself to look at your own gratitude meter. <clears throat> so would you describe yourself as a thankful person? Do you regularly express your gratitude to the people you love, the people who serve you, to a higher power I call God? Does it really matter or make a difference in your own or other people's well-being? The answer is a resounding yes. And today's an opportunity to understand the transforming benefits of gratitude and to begin to harness the power of gratitude to not only boost your happiness, but to reduce stress and improve your physical health. And who knew that my parents' installation of the value of thank you could be so good for me? So I have a seven point test to determine your place on the gratitude scale. And I, you have some, an opportunity to take notes if you'd like. Um, the handouts are there, so I, I pretty much gave you an outline. So if there's anything that really strikes you you want to hang on to, you might want to jot a few things down. But I'd ask you to, Consider these questions honestly. How often do you compare yourself to other people? If you're given a gift, do you usually feel surprised and blessed or disappointed? You're expecting more. Are you more likely to say, I wish I had, or I'm so grateful for? Are you a complainer? How often do you complain? 
How frequently do you find yourself resenting people who seem to have more than you do? Do you feel resentful when you have to wait in line? Do you feel that you've earned everything you have in life? And if your answer to these questions at any of them, or most of them, is yes or often, you may have an attitude of what we find in our culture quite a bit, and that's an attitude of entitlement rather than an attitude of gratitude. And the good news is that there is an easy way to fix this. You have the power to choose gratitude. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you just for a moment, if you would, just take one second and write down a couple words of what does gratitude mean to you? How would you define gratitude? your definition might compare to some of the people who've actually been researching gratitude. Um, Robert Emmons is one of the world's foremost um, experts on gratitude and he's done a ton of research on it. And he defines, <clears throat> excuse me, gratitude as a sense of wonder, thankfulness, and appreciation for life. And he goes on to say that it consists of two separate but interconnected parts. One part it's when we acknowledge the goodness that we have in our lives. And then the other is, it's a recognition that the source of these blessings lies at least partially outside of ourselves. So he's further stating that when we're grateful, we acknowledge that other people, or even a higher power if you're of a spiritual mindset, gave us many gifts, big and small, to help us achieve goodness in our own lives. Another um, researcher of positive psychology is Valerie Burton, um, and she defines gratitude as simply the expression of thankfulness for the blessings of life. She says, gratitude is about others. It's an act of humility that acknowledges we could not be who we are or where we are without the generosity and contribution of others. And it's also the recognition that there is good in the world and that God's grace and love abounds something we need to remind ourselves when we see all of the, the terror and the violence in our world, that there is good in it. Now, some people debate whether gratitude is an emotion or is it a virtue. And I say it's both. It, and it's something else. It's a choice. Gratitude is the act and the feeling of thankfulness for a gift. The most happy and successful people are very aware that life and everything in it is undeserved. They see themselves as blessed and fortunate, and they practice the attitude of gratitude. And the foundation for gratitude is a belief or a perception that we are fortunate. And that positive awareness results in a feeling of gratefulness, a lighter spirit, and a willingness to give to other people. So let's take a look at the opposite of it because we see a lot of this, I think. And it's through the attitude of entitlement. So people who feel entitled are always miserable because the world never seems to provide everything they feel they deserve. Rather than being grateful for a morning of sunshine, they're angry because they have to endure an afternoon of rain. Instead of feeling blessed because they have a spouse who loves them, they feel annoyed that their mate doesn't meet their needs perfectly. And as a result, people who feel a sense of entitlement are continually miserable, while those who choose to be grateful have a sense of well-being and joy. Welcome. Are you David? Yes. Hi, David. Hi. It's important to note that being grateful doesn't depend on having everything you want in life, which we sometimes think. Just as you can have hope when things are going poorly, so you can be grateful when you seem to possess so little. It all depends on how you choose to look at your situation. And each of us has a basic framework for viewing our lives. Positive people see themselves as blessed, whether they have much or little. Negative thinkers, though, see themselves as deprived, whether they have little 
or much. Their circumstances don't determine their attitude. Their outlook determines it. So you see, each of us has a story for our lives, a way we think of ourselves. The story that you tell yourself about life, it rises from the vision you have for the world, and it largely determines the way you respond to the world and the way other people respond to you. Some people see themselves as poor, downtrodden, never able to catch a break. And not surprisingly, they interpret every event that happens to them in a very negative light. If they receive a gift, they compare it to others and what they've received. And then they conclude that they didn't receive enough. If they get a raise, they wonder why it wasn't larger. Their basic storyline is this, life is unfair to me. On the other hand, there are others who see themselves as fortunate, victorious, and even blessed. As a result, they interpret everything that happens to them in a positive light. When their car breaks down, they're just glad somebody stopped by to help them. When they receive a gift, they feel genuinely humbled. When they get sick, they say, I'm so glad I get to go to a doctor for treatment because there's so many people who are not as fortunate as I am. And their basic storyline is this, life gives me more than I deserve. So you would think that people in first world countries like the United States would be the happiest people on earth, right? Incomes in the United States, Great Britain, and Japan have doubled over the last 50 years. And yet, we've been able to measure happiness in people over these, this time frame, and, it's, and we have found out that happiness has not increased. And one of the reasons why happiness has not increased, even though our incomes have, is due to a phenomenon called hedonic adaptation. What this means is as you get used to having more, you no longer see those gains as a big deal. So unless you're intentionally grateful. So back when most middle class families had one car and they all shared it, it was obvious why if in those families they had more, they would tend to be more grateful. In the 1960s, most homes had a garage or carport that only fit a single car. But now many of us have two or three car garages. And of course the expectation that comes with it is to fill it with two or three cars. That's become our norm. So it may not occur to you to notice around us that there are people in our own town who don't own a car, and some who may want one, but they can't afford it right now. Who do we compare ourselves? We compare ourselves usually to those who have more, not to less. Turn on the TV, look at billboards, open your favorite magazine, or just even launch your internet browser and you're going to be bombarded with images of what you ought to have and the suggestion that everyone else already has it. The materialism of our age is poisonous to an attitude of gratitude, and the antidote is to intentionally notice the good in your life. So I ask you, do you remember the last gadget or car that you so desperately wanted because you thought you would be so happy when you got it? That's how most of us feel. We look forward to new things. Then, when we get them, although there's usually a temporary boost in happy feelings, we eventually get used to them. And having the thing we thought would make us happy becomes our new normal. And we adjust to the improving circumstances. That's hedonic adaptation. You get used to pleasure, and you need more and more. So we seek out the next thing we believe we need in order to be happy. So I have an iPhone 6S, which I really, really like. It's got a nice big screen. But then all of a sudden, iPhone 8 has come out, which has led me to wonder, is this good enough anymore? And so what this does for us is that we start, we step onto what is also called a hedonic treadmill. People mistakenly believe that anything from a new computer to a new spouse will make them happier. And you notice this even with kids. Pay attention, we, we've got Christmas coming up, and you know the new toy or the gadget they were all excited about on their Christmas list is quickly tossed aside because they're now bored with it after a few days. Just like running it on a treadmill doesn't get you physically anywhere new, constantly replacing the old 
with something new doesn't really get us closer to happiness. I'm probably not going to be any happier if I trade this baby in for the iPhone 8. In fact, I'll probably just be disappointed, so I'm going to just hang on to it. We're generally poor predictors of what will make us happy. And we're subject to the false belief that better, newer, faster, younger will make us happier and more successful. So unfortunately, the bad news in all of this is hedonic adaptation shows that we will never be satisfied. Ugh, we're never satisfied. And it's not just because of your character. It's just how we are wired. We are never satisfied. And you know who really counts on that? Advertisers. They count on that. And that helps explain why consumerism is so alive and well. They're constantly tempting us with newer, better, shinier, faster. And of course, better, supposedly. So if you don't learn to be grateful for what you have when you have it, you may learn the hard way that the grass is not usually greener on the other side. And all the debt we Americans are in only sadly underscores the trap we so often find ourselves in. So what's the good news? How do we counteract this effect of hedonic adaptation? Very simply, by counting our blessings. If we consciously remind ourselves of our blessings, it should become harder to take them for granted and adapt to them. Wanting what you already have is a hallmark of happiness, and in particular, gratitude. Deliberate appreciation can reduce our tendency to depreciate what we have and make it less likely that we will then go out and have to replace it with something newer, faster, better. So a question I ask you, as you look at your life and do an inventory of all that you have, do you want what you have? And if not, can you find some reasons to appreciate your belongings and be content until circumstances allow you to have something different? There's a certain ease of life that occurs when you don't always feel like you are on pins and needles waiting for life to come together. There's a joy that comes when you embrace your current circumstances. So contentment and gratitude are very interconnected. Gratitude empowers you to notice what's right in front of you. It opens your mind to the little blessings that if they suddenly disappeared, they wouldn't seem so little anymore. A little thing like when you go out to start your car in the morning and you get that key in the ignition and you go, er, 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 and the car doesn't start, okay, what do we do? We take it for granted, don't we? Until it doesn't start. And that might be the next day when you hit that ignition and, a room and it starts right up just like, Thank you, because we just became reminded of how important it is to us. So gratitude is more than having good manners. It is a discipline and a practice that has some amazing benefits. And so this is where it's kind of exciting to see why it's so important. So I've, I've kind of made a case for how unhappy we can be in life, but what could boost our happiness? And it turns out gratitude is one of the things. There's been a ton of research in the last decade on the benefits of gratitude. And it turns out that not only is gratitude an emotion that, well, we know it helps us to feel good, it's connected to a number of other things, psychological, physical, and social benefits as well. One happiness, happiness researcher said that she described gratitude as an antidote to negative emotions, a neutralizer of envy, hostility, worry, and irritation. So who knew? You could be on your job feeling irritated or worrying about something or feeling envious of someone else. And if you turn your mind to gratitude, you can neutralize those emotions. Other findings show that gratitude is, is indeed one of the main ways we can boost our feelings of happiness. People who are grateful report lower levels of depression. Their physical health improves. They have more meaningful interpersonal relationships and are way more compassionate and forgiving toward other people. And when we practice gratitude more regularly, we're more likely to have good things happen to us because it attracts more good. Gratitude is something that can be cultivated, it can be practiced, and it can be worked on no matter where you're starting from. Even if today you don't view yourself as a very grateful person, it's okay. 
Because the good news is, even if it hasn't been a practice until now, that you can learn the art and the practice of it. By wanting what we have and integrating gratitude more into our lives, we're gonna transform, we're gonna change our lives, and they are gonna boost our happiness level. And I know all of us really enjoy being happy. That's a lot more fun than sad. So I'm gonna take you on just a brief journey. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes for just one moment, if you would, please. I invite you to close your eyes, and I'd like you to just think about something that you feel grateful for right at this moment in time. It doesn't have to be anything big. It could be something very small. It could be something that's happened recently or something in the distant past. And I want you to just bring that experience, that person or thing or being or memory. Get in touch with what feelings are attached to that? What emotions come up for you? And just take a moment and just bask in that good feeling. Okay, I'll have you come back for just a moment. So if you're like many people, when you focus on an object of gratitude like I just invited you to do, so it was a memory or person, would anyone be willing to share what, what was your object of gratitude? You don't have to say much about it, but was it a person, place, thing, memory? Nobody was grateful? <laughs> don't be shy. We're a small group. Person. A person. OK. How about? So we were talking about this last night, we had a finance meeting, and I'm grateful for this old beater pickup I have because it works great and it always starts and it doesn't matter if it gets down. And, uh, <laughs> you love your old pickup, huh? Right. Okay. David, I'm very grateful that um, <clears throat> I bought this little smart car and I'm just like, this, is, this thing's ridiculous, but it was cheap. I needed a commuter and I'm just really grateful that it hasn't, like, blown up yet, right? <laughs> so, and it gets you where you want to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, even if you can't take a lot of people with you. Yeah. One person. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Yeah. So when you started to, to plug into those things, did it bring an internal smile to your face? And it didn't, may not have done it externally, but internally, when you guys talked about it, you did smile. Um, that naturally happens when we talk about things we're grateful for. We, we begin to smile. And it's in smiling, by the way, boosts our happiness. Even even if you don't feel like smiling, when you smile, that the muscles in your face trigger something in your brain, which automatically releases feel-good chemicals. So even a fake smile, <laughs> amazingly, can have a positive boost to our mood. Okay, so if you are like most of us, when and this is just my point here, is when you're focusing on the things you're grateful for, you probably begin to notice a sense of feelings of peace, joy, tranquility, feeling calm, and, and maybe even feeling very contented. <clears throat> and when I ask people to think about things they're grateful for, I don't tend to hear I'm unhappy, I'm angry, I'm bitter, feeling stressed or angry when they talk about those things. In fact, those things just kind of get pushed to the side. Amazing, isn't it? that just putting our focus on something we're grateful for can allow stress, anger, resentment, shift, move away. And of course, we know that now that gratitude serves as kind of a sort of a, what you call a gateway emotion, in that it tends to lead directly to other positive feelings and connecting to other good things in our lives. And I would imagine that, like you or like me, I, I like to feel good during the day. And when I find myself getting stressed, I have to remind myself there's something good right now. It happened on the way here, actually. Um, I got behind some very slow moving traffic, and I was getting stressed that I was going to be late. And I started getting that anxiety feeling coming up for me. And I thought, what are you going to be talking about? Zap. And it truly, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to myself just as much as anybody else because we need these frequent reminders of the importance of, of being thankful. 
once you zapped yourself, did that feeling coming up here go away? It did. It did. In fact, what came right along with that is take a breath. Take a breath, a deep breath. And that's what I did. And, I, and it's like, I'm going to get there. I'll get there. And I did. And I was early. So research has found that gratitude leads to greater optimism and forgiveness increases our happiness and life satisfaction, and it also serves as a protective factor against episodes of depression due to the fact, I found this very interesting, that gratitude undoes the effects of harmful thinking patterns that are common for people who are struggling with depression. When we're depressed, what do we do? We focus on the negative aspect of our mm -hmm. lives. And then we tend to get into this unhealthy rumination. We just keep thinking like a train on a track, going around in a circle. We keep thinking about our problems. There were some really instrumental studies done in 2005 where they started to study gratitude. And they did the study where they had um, people participate in 15 days of gratitude practice. And what they found is substantial relief for patients who initially had scored in the severe range of depression. After that very brief period, only 15 days, so that's just slightly over two weeks, over 90%, that is astonishing to me, over 90% reported experiencing relief of, a, of their depression and their scores dropped from severe to average range for depressive symptoms. Just 15 days, that was the only intervention, 15 days of focusing on gratitude. So not only does it help those with depression, but they found that the practice of gratitude can help those who are also suffering from trauma. And the greater levels of gratitude was linked to greater positive emotions and increased self-esteem among trauma survivors. And we think of trauma as, this is, these are like the severe cases of stress and depression, but it impacted those people as well. And so whether you want help to just recover if you struggle with depression or even anxiety or mer merely want to just be a bit happier. Gratitude is a powerful way to do that. It's a great way to improve your life. What's the second major benefit is this. It's great for our physical health. I love this study that um, really shows this. There was a study where they um, had three groups of research participants. The first group was asked to record um, there are five things that they felt particularly grateful for that had occurred in the previous week. Okay, so there was the gratitude group. The second group was asked to keep track of hassles or things that bothered them. So they had to write down five negative things, so their hassles. And then a third group was said, you can keep track of positive or negative, we don't care. Just keep track of five things. Now during this time, all of the people in all of these groups were completing extensive journals and surveys, and they were assessing themselves in a range of areas, including their mood, their sleep, exercise habits, and, and other things. And at the end of 10 weeks, the data that they collected showed significant difference between the three groups. Now, you can probably guess where this is going because of the why would I bring this up? Well, as you might imagine, compared to the other two groups, those in the gratitude group reported fewer health complaints, and they endorsed far fewer symptoms of physical illness overall, and they exercised more, a full 90 minutes longer than those who tracked their hassles. And even more interesting is they found that their sleep improved. So as subjects talked about their sleep, they said that they got to sleep easier, more quickly, they stayed asleep, and when they woke up in the morning, they felt much more rested and refreshed. And then a later study found that by focusing on the good in our lives, the nature of our thoughts changes just before bedtime. So here's an example of a good practice is that if you shift your focus to gratitude before you go to sleep, it actually promotes rest you get a better night's sleep. So you probably heard the adage of count your sheep. You know, if you can't get sleep, count the sheep. Help yourself fall asleep. The findings in this study show that we are better off counting our blessings in order to fall asleep more quickly and to feel more rested. And it is true, because you know, if you get in, in bed and you find yourself doing, you know, this thinking what I gotta do tomorrow or you know, what happened today, the things you're fretting about, things that are keeping you up, 
shift and think about what is it I'm really grateful for. A third benefit of gratitude is it does our relationships good. And that is one of the key things here is that it improves how we get along with people. It helps us to be more outlone, outgoing, less lonely, and less likely to be isolated. Gratitude can even help us become more forgiving toward other people and able to let go of resentments. He found that even among divorced couples, a group that, of course, we tend to think of them as being resentful and angry, when they practice gratitude, it reduced their negative feelings and it promoted forgiveness. So if you're looking to improve a relationship with somebody, practice gratitude with them. Be grateful for them and express it. And gratitude, we found, also improves our finances. So why would that be the case? Well, it turns out that when people are sad, they tend to be impatient. Gratitude, on the other hand, is associated with more patience. So as a result, people tend to value larger, long-term financial gains over smaller, short-term ones. So grateful people are more willing to be patient with their money and less likely to make impulsive financial decisions. So if I, we find out that the reason why gratitude has all these impacts is because it changes our brain. Um, in a couple areas, serotonin and dopamine, these are neurotransmitters that these are very connected with our moods. And what they have found is that when we practice gratitude, these neurotransmitter levels increase, which increases our feeling of good. It's the feel good. And not only that, in the case of dopamine, it actually serves as an energizer. More grateful people tend to be more energetic. A third area is the hypothalamus. And this is a small area of the brain that's responsible for helping us with our sleep, our stress level, and our metabolism. And of course, what I said before, health, sleep, exercise, mood, um, those are all things we saw improved with gratitude. Well, it's because it's impacting that part of your brain, your hypothalamus. And then one final area is the left prefrontal cortex, which is considered to be the center for positive emotions, including love, happiness, and compassion. And research has discovered there's an increased neural activity in that part of your brain when you regularly practice gratitude. Wow, it impacts your brain. So we can conclude gratitude literally changes our brain for the better. And it's probably much easier when things are going well in life, right? But what about when things are not so great, when things are hard? Is it really realistic to practice gratitude during times of heartache and adversity and, and hardship? Can it really help us then? Well, there's probably no better example of this than on our country's celebration of Thanksgiving. It was during times of, it was not during times of abundance and prosperity that our National Days of Thanks was founded. Rather, it came on the, the heels of a particularly difficult and challenging time period in our forefathers' history. The very first Thanksgiving holiday was held following a difficult year in which nearly half of the pilgrims at Pil uh, Plymouth Plantation had died due to famine, disease, and harsh condition. But even in spite of these hardships, they recognized the importance of giving thanks for what they had and that such a, such a practice could strengthen them and give them hope for a better future. Wouldn't it be great if we followed that example? Even though we set aside a day of Thanksgiving, I wonder how many homes are really focusing on that. Research has shown that practicing gratitude in times of struggle and adversity is not only helpful, but it's crucial. It doesn't necessarily mean we're thankful for the adversity. Nobody likes to go through bad things. But we can't deny that pain can sometimes enable us to grow and appreciate things that we wouldn't have otherwise. When we practice gratitude, it simply means that we have the power to choose each and every moment how we want to view our lives and what we wish to focus on. Practicing gratitude toward, during hard times enables us to feel hope when things seem hopeless and, and it inspires us and enables to shift our focus off the pain onto things we can be grateful for. Ten years ago, I went through a particularly challenging trial when I was diagnosed with and received treatment for breast cancer. And I'm going to tell you, it was an incredibly scary period, as that lovely woman in the back, who was a good friend of mine, could tell you, as she was there for me. 
Um, because it was during that time, as any diagnosis like that, um, makes you feel very uncertain about your future. And it was really, though, at that time that I became aware of how many people cared about and loved me. And I remember being so grateful for the doctors and the nurses who provided such good care. And I had excellent friends and family and coworkers who showed their love for me in such tangible ways. And I found it was harder and harder to focus on the negative and the fear and all the things that were negative about that situation when I had so much good surrounding me. And so it allowed me to shift focus and to be grateful because I thought if I wasn't going through that experience, I would not have known how much people cared about me. I never realized until that time. And I believe, and through all of this, I'm making a case for why gratitude is so important to us. And it is the fruit of choosing your words, your thoughts, your actions, and your habits. It will totally change and revolutionize your life if you're not doing it now. It is absolutely good for our minds, bodies, and souls. So what are some things I'm going to offer to you to get, get you practicing gratitude more? Is I encourage you to focus on people as much as you can as you think about gratitude. Who? Who impacts your life on a day-to-day -day basis? Maybe it's a, you know, you have a pleasant checkout clerk. Or someone opens the door for you. I mean, it's the small things. And what are people around you doing that really impacts your life for the good? And not only notice it and, and keep track of it, but say something to them. Appreciate people. Notice the small things. Get into a rhythm. We're going to talk about some ways you can get into a regular routine of keeping track of the gratitude. I encourage you to get visual. Put notes around your, your, your car, your home, to remind you what are things that you're grateful for. Maybe it's a picture. You could have one of those digital photo frames of a favorite memory, some times with loved ones. Um, and of course, it's really important to not just go through the motions, but to really get into the experience of it. And if you're writing it down, don't worry if it's, it wouldn't get an A from your English teacher. Who cares? Just write down what matters to you. And it's also helpful if you have someone to keep you accountable for it. Now, I'm on the next set of sheets, um, I have provided for you the gratitude practices that I would encourage you to consider. Um, these are practices that you could do daily, weekly, or once in a while. Um, and I encourage you to kind of vary it a little bit because you know we can again because of adaptation if we keep saying the same five things of oh I'm so thankful for my health, my family, blah 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 blah. That's so generic and it really doesn't get at the true feelings. So you could do the three good things practice um, where you, every night for the next two weeks before you go to bed write three things that went well for you that day. And it doesn't matter if it's big or little. Um, and then right by that say why did it go well? What what was my part in that? And after a couple of weeks, if you keep track of this for two weeks, you will have something like 47, 46, 47 different things that you noted that made your life better. Can you imagine how that can impact your mood? Just over two, two weeks. So this is a huge change, but I'm going to invite you to do it. Put it by your bed, because what we know, it helps you get to sleep. And it's a way to refocus your brain so your thoughts are on the good. Another practice is the gratitude journal, where people keep track of on a weekly basis. Five things they're very grateful for. Again, as you look back over the week, what are five things that really stand out to you? Can you imagine how cool that would be to two years from now look back and see, gosh, you know, I forgot about that. That was really cool. It triggers memory, but not only does it trigger memory, it triggers good feelings. So it's a way to extend those feelings. Another practice, you might find this very interesting, is reflecting on a hardship. So go back to a place in time that was really painful for you. When I go back and I, you know, I wrote that little bit about um, my breast cancer journey, I mean, that was a painful time. I mean, I just kind of very flippantly you know, said that to you. But when I go back and I think about what that was like when I heard those words cancer and when I found out I had to have you know, mastectomy and I had to have chemotherapy and all of those things, I, it, was, it was horrible. It was a horrible time in my life. But any time I've gone back and reflected on that I, and where I am today, I think I'm alive. I didn't know 10 years ago I would be alive today. And you better believe that increases my sense of gratitude. I have chills just telling you that right now because it is absolutely a fact. So looking at a hardship can be a way to increase your gratitude. Or consider a day of thanks. Now, we know Thanksgiving is set apart, but this is a little different. This is where you decide 
sometime over the next month that you are going to put one date on the calendar that it is going to be your day of thanksgiving. So what you're going to do on that day is you're going to go out of your way to express gratitude to people. They could be strangers, they could be someone you know. But you are going to be very intentional about doing things to express your gratitude for people. Okay, so, and then write it down. How was that? What was that like for you to keep track of that? And then a, a final suggestion is gratitude letter or visit. Think of somebody in your life who's helped you along the way. Someone that maybe you've never really properly thanked. It could be a relative, it could be a teacher, it could be a neighbor. Somebody who's really impacted your life. And so often, we go to the grave with our gratitude without having expressed the impact somebody's had on us. And I'm going to encourage you not to do that. Because do you know what, you, what impact your words could have on somebody else? To express the appreciation for what they've meant to you. And there are a few kinds of questions that could help you get started to write that letter. Um, I've, I've listed them on the sheet for you. To just get you prompted. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be fancy. But write it out, and then you could take it a step further and go visit them and give it to them or read it to them. And if they're not in the area, you can mail it to them. You know, so it's, it's just a, a small thing. Perhaps it's not small. It's really a big thing. And it would be a big deal. Um, I did have a video I wanted to show you, but I know that I don't have enough time to show it, so we'll skip over that. Um, and this is really what I want you to get in touch with today. If you can, in your mind, as, you, as we close out our time together, um, put yourself on that beach. Take a deep breath. Listen to the waves. Look up to the sky. There's so many things. There are just so many things that we can be grateful for. I'm grateful for that when I came in, I put my flash drive in, and the computer was all set up for me, and everything worked. I'm thankful that you were here to greet me. Thank you. And for going to make my copies. Thank you. And I'm grateful for you guys that, you know, you could have done something else with your lunch hour, but you decided to join me because for whatever reason, if it was to get your wellness credit, or because you really care about this topic, or maybe you came, but now you realize maybe this is a good thing. I'm thankful. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm thankful for the lights. Gosh, you know, if we didn't have electricity, I couldn't have done this as well. You know, we can go on and on. Isn't it great to be able to sit on a comfortable chair? <laughs> so it may sound trite, but I can't tell you enough that I think this room, that we can change wherever we go today. We can, we can make an impact on the environment of where you're working the people you're surrounding yourself with as you go home this evening and you're around your family, your loved ones, friends, think about how can you be a representative of gratitude? And maybe you be the one to change the climate in your, your work, in your family, and most importantly, in your own internal space. Take good care of yourselves and be grateful. And be grateful for yourself. Be grateful for all the great things you have going on you're all wonderful people. You all have great strengths and abilities and talents. And you bring something to this world that is important. And be grateful for that. Any questions anyone has about anything I talked about today? Well, that's my business, Crossroads Renewal Coaching and Counseling. I do have my brochures and um, some business cards. If you are ever interested in learning about how to help your life get better, um, I love to coach people. I love to help people achieve their goals and their dreams. So um, thank you for your attention today, and I, I wish you a, a grateful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.